So anyways, uh, I hope you're all doing well. Let me tell you where we're heading this morning. Last week, I was sitting somewhere over there, and I was listening to the sermon, and Basil said just one thing that um, caught my attention in a certain way. He said uh, that in the book of Acts, which we've been looking at lately, in the book of Acts, there's a big message that... We, the church, are the temple. And he said that, and, you know, I've heard that before. I know that is one of the big messages of the Bible, of the New Testament, and the book of Acts in different ways, that we are the temple. And there's a lot of theology there that we don't have time to get into. What was the temple in the Old Testament? Uh, It was the center of religious worship for the Jews. It was... Uh, The idea is that is where the presence of God dwelt. So if you wanted to draw close to God, you would go to the temple. And so there's this idea that we, the church, we are the temple. And maybe you've heard that before, maybe you haven't. But anyways, I was sitting over there, and when he said that, I thought in my mind, the Spirit of God filled the temple. There was a couple times in the Bible where the Spirit of God filled the temple. And I thought to myself, you know what? When I go to church on Monday, I'm going to read about those times in the Old Testament where the Spirit of God filled the temple. And I thought, you know what? I should because maybe there's something there for us. Maybe there's something there for us at this present moment. So I did that. Um, Monday morning, um, went went in and I actually had to Google. I'm like, when does, uh, what are the times in the Bible that the Spirit of God filled the temple? And And uh, so I started, and um, well, let me read you one of the passages that I came across, okay? Um, Exodus chapter 40, beginning in verse 1. So this is very Old Testament. This is uh, uh, God speaking to Moses. Let me just read it, and then we'll talk. And then hopefully we'll see why we are all here looking at this certain passage. So um, Exodus chapter 40, beginning verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, set up the tabernacle, the tent of meeting on the first day of the first month, place the ark of the covenant law in it and shield the ark with the curtain, bring in the table and set out what belongs on it. Then bring in the lampstand and set up its lamps. Place the gold altar of incense in front of the Ark of the Covenant Law and put the curtain at the entrance to the tabernacle. Okay, to be technical, this is actually not talking about the temple yet. This is the tabernacle, the thing that would become the temple. So uh, also called the, the Tent of Meeting, which is an interesting name, which is actually a, a very... Descriptive name in the Old Testament, this is the tent of meeting, and by meeting, who would meet there? The tent of meeting is where Moses would meet with God. God would talk to Moses like a man talks to his friend. That's the sort of meeting that Moses would have with God. That is where they would meet with God. And let me just, let me just remind us or tell you this. The purpose of this, what we do here, The purpose of church, the purpose of religion, is to meet with God. It's it's more than it's more than religious rules and instructions and teachings. It's about meeting a person, meeting the person of God. It's the, the tent of meeting, the church. The purpose of the church is so that we so that we may meet with God. And actually, when I think about what my job is here on a Sunday, my first, in my heart, the first thing that is on my mind that I am wanting is not to bring good teaching, although teaching is, of course, important. The first thing on my mind is not to give good leadership. Although casting vision and leading the church is also important. What is most important to me for a Sunday service and for a sermon is that somehow, somehow God himself would give me words that I could speak that would give all of us a sense that God is with us. A sense of his presence, of his his personhood. 
the highest goal that I have for us when we come is that we would worship and we would be brought to a place of worship in spirit and truth. Not just singing words, not just going through religious routines, but actually having a sense God is real, God is with us, God is here, God is alive. This is amazing. That is what I would hope, that is what God wants the church to be, the place of meeting, the tent of meeting, a place to truly meet with God. And so anyways, hear this, hear this. What are we doing here? What are we doing here? Why am I reading this Old Testament passage? Well, it was Monday and I was reading and thinking, okay, God, do you have us here for a reason? Is there a reason? When Basil was speaking, I thought to myself, I should dive into that. So I read this passage. It starts with um, just what I just said. The Lord said to Moses, set up the tabernacle, set it up, set it up. And then if you read this for 33 verses, that's what's happening. God is giving Moses specific instructions how to set it up. Set it up. We read a little bit of it here. Um, The ark and the curtain, um, the table and and the things that belong on it. And if you keep reading it, what belongs on the table is bread. Put this in the back of your mind. We might come back to it. The table with the bread, uh, the what else? The lamp stand and the lamps. Okay, so you got the lamps, the, uh, the table with the bread, the incense, um, various things that all had symbolic meaning that we don't have time to get into at this moment at least. And anyways, Moses said, God said to Moses, set it up. And you read it and he's just doing just that. He's setting up a bunch of different things. And I started thinking of myself, I started thinking to myself, are there things, are there things that we should be setting up, okay? Because something is about to happen. Something, the, the, the whole reason that I started reading this passage, something is going to happen later in the chapter. God's going to do something great. But here, Moses is told to just do some certain things, set it up, set it up, and actually, uh, A phrase that I had heard years ago came to my mind, and hear this. You cannot create a move of God, but you can prepare for one, okay? You cannot create a move of God, but you can prepare for one. There's things you can do to prepare. And so I kind of saw Moses here is doing just that. Set it up, set it up. And you read about these different things that he did to set up, to prepare. And I started thinking, are there things that we should be doing? Are there things that God wants us to do to prepare for a move of God, to set it up, so to speak? And this all sat in my mind for about a day. And the next day, I'm back here. And just to tell you how this works, for me, what I am doing as I prepare a sermon. I start to let my mind go down certain places, and there's always a part of me that's like, okay, is this God leading me? And then there's another part of me that's like, you're just letting your mind wander, and it's going, you know, what's the point of all this? Like, is God with me? Is he leading us? Or am I just thinking about random stuff that doesn't really do anything? That's like the battle in my head. And you know what? To some degree, the battle in all of our heads, because there's something the devil would love for you to think, and it's that God is not with you. And if you know who Jesus is... If you've believed in him, his spirit is with you, leading you. Oh, my, if I had more time, I'd go down that road. But let me just tell you this again. If you know who Jesus is, his spirit is leading you. And the devil would love for you to think you're just wandering aimlessly. But he said it. I am with you always. And anyways, so at this point... In my week, I'm looking at these verses and I'm thinking, all right, Lord, do you have something for us? Is there something that we should be setting up, so to speak? And I kind of felt like I needed a little confirmation about where I was headed. And that night, I was going to see some people from the prayer team for our elder meeting. And so I sent a text message to Barb, who leads the prayer meeting. And I was like, hey, 
uh, just wondering, I know you and, you know, the, the prayer team take things very seriously. Is there anything that, as you guys are getting together, is there anything, like, on your heart, anything that you're feeling or thinking? And Barb says, via text, yes, call me. And I was like, okay. And I call her, and she said, yeah, actually, me and some people from the prayer team, we got together, and we all felt like God was speaking the same thing to us. All right, well, what is it? She said, it's just this. This is the word that we felt we got. Prepare the way. And that just hit me because in my mind, I've been thinking the same thing. Set it up. You can't, you can't create a move of God, but you can prepare for one. Prepare the way. Prepare the way. This, there's a calling on us now. Prepare the way. Prepare the way. Well, what does that mean for us? Obviously, we're not dealing with, um, you know, uh, Lamp stands and lamps and incense and, you know, a uh, special table with what belongs on it being bread. Well, actually, we, we do have that here. But um, what is it that we need to prepare? What, what does this mean for us? What is this? Set it up, Moses. Set it up. Prepare the way. What do we, what do we need to prepare? Before I answer that question, what are we preparing for? What are we preparing for? What was the reason I started reading this in the first place? What happens at the end of Exodus chapter 40 after 33 verses of Moses doing these random preparatory acts of setting it up? What happens after 33 verses? And it says, so Moses did everything the Lord commanded. And then in verse 34, it says this, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Filled, filled. Two words, that, that, two times that word filled, and that's the word that originally sent me there. The Spirit of God filled the temple, filled the tabernacle. And this is, this is repeated. Acts, uh, or, or uh, 1 Kings chapter 8 uh, Second Chronicles chapter 5, God fills the temple after, um, in those cases, Solomon does these certain tasks. God himself fills. And we know, if you, if you study the Bible and you understand how all this works together, Old Testament, New Testament, we know that the things in the Old Testament are often shadows of things to come. That's how it says it in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. Those are shadows, as in foreshadows, signs pointing to something greater. The temple, the whole purpose of God from beginning to the end is that his people would become the temple. Meaning this filling, this Filling that we read about would happen to us. We, we would be filled with the presence, with the spirit, with the glory of God would fill us. That is the call. That is the intention. And that, my friends, is what we need to be preparing for. To be filled. Filled. The cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The glory of the Lord. That is something you see a lot in the Bible. The glory of the Lord. And it can be kind of mysterious. What are we talking about the glory of the Lord? Don't think of the glory of the Lord as some sort of aspect or, or part of his being. Something he does. No, no. The glory of the Lord means... God himself. The gl God's glory is simply his character, the, the essence of who he is, his attributes. The glory of the Lord is the presence of the Lord, the personhood of the Lord. Let me just talk a little bit about my own story. I don't have time to get into all of it. Maybe you've heard this before, but there was a time when I very much did not believe in the God of the Bible. Very, very much did not believe that. Uh, at one point, I, I was a hard atheist, but then I started to open myself up to certain spiritual things, and I started to believe in certain, certain spiritual things, okay? But not the God of the Bible. And on one evening, in a, a very dramatic way, I was confronted with a truth. I was confronted with a presence. A presence, and the thing 
Well, there were a number of things, but one of the things that knocked me on my butt, so to speak, was the idea that there was a person here. The presence of God was not simply, um, it, it, it wasn't simply just a, a, a powerful feeling. It was a person, and a person of, this is a hard word to define, and I don't even know if I can do it, holiness, holy. There was a person, there was a person who was holy, and that completely changed my life forever. And beloved, in the Old Testament, you could probably even say this is one of the great messages of the Old Testament, is the holy does not, cannot, will not mix with the unholy. Do you hear that? And that's, that's what we're reading right here. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the glory, the cloud had settled on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The holy does not, cannot, will not mix with the unholy. And when the unholy, if you read the Old Testament, when the unholy gets a little too close to the holy, Bad things happen, all right? Trust me. And beloved, this in itself, I mean, we, we read earlier when it, the, the ark, bring the ark into the tabernacle and make sure there's a, a shield, a curtain shielding it, right? We read, I don't know if you caught it. And the reason that curtain was there is because the ark is where the presence of God would, would dwell and you do not let, you do not want to get too close, Right? Because the holy doesn't mix well with the unholy. And beloved, this is just honest truth time. In our lives, we've lived unholy lives. That's what it means to be a sinner, to miss the mark. And what is the mark? The mark is holiness. That is the call of God. What did Jesus say? Be holy. But the thing is, as sinners, we haven't been. That is the very thing that makes us sinners, having not lived holy lives. And beloved, the plan of God from the beginning was to tear this curtain. And that's what we read about when Jesus, the Son of God, the perfect holy man, the perfect holy Son of God, when he was crucified for us, when his, his blood was shed for our forgiveness, The curtain tore. The curtain tore and a way was made. A way by which sinful man can meet, can enter into the tent of meeting, can meet with the holy God. Hear this, hear this. Jesus died for our forgiveness, absolutely. But more than that, he died so that we may become holy, not just better people, but holy, because it is still true, beloved, the holy and the unholy will not, cannot mix. God's plan was not to lower his standards. His plan was to make us holy. And just as the Holy Spirit, the holy presence of God filled the tabernacle, filled the temple, what he has for us is to make us holy and to fill us, to fill us with the Holy Spirit. That's the promise. Actually, let's, um, let's, let's go to the New Testament because I told you this filling that you see in the Old Testament, uh, Exodus 40, 1 Kings 8, 2 Chronicles 5, this filling was, was a foreshadow, it was pointing at a greater feeling, the thing that God has for us. So let, let's, let's read about it. This is the, 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 the peak, the, the, the peak of the book of Acts. We've read it before, we will read it again. It's one of those things that you need to go back to because there's more there. Um, Acts chapter two, beginning verse one. When the day of Pentecost came, they, the believers, the disciples, 
They were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled, filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Filled. They were filled. They began to speak in languages they did not know that the Spirit of God uh, enabled them to do. And the purpose of this was a sign because there were people there who actually spoke those other languages. So the purpose here was showing the truth. This, this filling of the Holy Spirit had external manifestations. Uh, this is a longer conversation than we have time for right now. But this internal filling was an experience. No doubt, everywhere you read about this in the book of Acts, this filling of the Holy Spirit is always an experience. If you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you are aware that you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Do you hear me? It is an experience. These guys are filled. It's getting the attention of the people. There is a purpose to this filling. There's a number of purposes to this filling, but one of the purposes of this filling is so that those who are outside the tent of meeting, as in those who are outside the church, don't know the Lord, don't know who Jesus is, looks upon what is happening and says, there's something going on here that I cannot explain. There is a power here. That is one of the purposes of the filling. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. Witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Witnesses, people will look upon you and they will see. How did Jesus say it? You will be clothed on power, clothed with power from on high. We should not lower our expectations of what this filling is. Let the Bible tell us what this filling is. On that note, let's actually keep reading because what happened was they started speaking in languages that they didn't understand, but the people who were there understood them because it was their languages and they asked a very uh, reasonable question, what is going on here? How are you doing this? What's going on? And the apostle Peter, led by the Holy Spirit, opens his mouth and says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We should not lower our expectations of what the Christian life should be by looking around. By, by looking at how others do it. There is definitely something good to be found in having leaders and teachers and people who set a good example. There's absolutely something of value there. But let's let the scriptures define for us what the promise of the Christian life is. And beloved, it's gonna say it very clearly coming up. The promise is for you and for your children. What is the promise? The promise to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Just as the temple was filled in the Old Testament, the promise for the church. What does he say? On your sons, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Old men see visions, or young men see visions, old men dream dreams. Servants, men and women, men and women, young and old, they will prophesy, that's what it says. Let's talk about this for just a little bit. If you've been around church for a while, you know that these things, such as people prophesizing, those are known as spiritual gifts. And some people, they might say, actually, let, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. When it comes to you, let's say you prophesizing, the Spirit of God coming upon you and you having a word to speak to someone else about God, 
Are you open to that? Are you open to prophesizing? I hope you said yes, but let me tell you something. That's not enough. I mean, just hear me out here. Are you open? Are you open to the spiritual gifts such as prophecy? And if you said yes, that's good, but it's not enough. It's not enough to be open to those things. What does it say? 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1. Earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. It's not enough to be open. It's not enough to want it. Earnestly desire. Strongly want it. Want it. What this simply means is want to be filled with the Spirit of God in a way that brings forth power, in a way that blesses others. Want it. Want it a lot. Earnestly desire. Want this. When you read about this promise, don't let it sit on the shelf. Let it be something that you want. Because I'm going to get into this in a little bit. The enemy of our Christian life is complacency. Complacency. Um, I said that word. Let me go ahead and define it. Actually, an interesting thing happened this week. I, I, I thought about that word, complacency. I thought about complacency. And I thought, you know what? I know what that word means. But let me just look it up just to be sure. <laughs> As in, I wanted to make sure that I, I actually... I, I was just curious of what the dictionary definition was. And uh, anyways, later that day, I was uh, with the young adults, and that word came up, and someone asked me, what does that word mean? And I was like, interestingly, I just looked it up today. <laughs> so I know what Oxford has to say about complacency, and I thought the definition was really interesting. The definition for complacency is this, uncritical satisfaction. Do you hear that? Uncritical satisfaction, and I thought that's really interesting because satisfaction is good. Contentment is great if it is based on what is truly good. To be uncritically satisfied, let me say this. Let me say this. This, this is what complacency is as, as far as the way I want you to think about it. Complacency is being okay with not being filled with the Holy Spirit of God. That is complacency. Being okay with something less than the promise of God. That's complacency. And beloved, it's an enemy of your soul. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Here, this stuff about um, blood and fire and smoke, it's not unclear what this is referring to. Um, I mean, it says it right there, the great and glorious day of the Lord. Here, the apostle Peter is speaking to the Jews who knew the Old Testament. Later, actually last week, Basil read parts of Acts 17, where Paul is speaking to people who know nothing about this. But both Peter and Paul speaking to the Jews and speaking to the Gentiles, part of the message was, God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world. That is part of the message for both Jews and Gentiles, for those who have the religion and don't have the religion. And this is something to not dismiss by any means, but to hear and to hold and to prepare yourself for. There is a day by which God will judge the world. The dead will be raised and the day of judgment will occur. And lest you be overly shaken by this, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How easy is salvation? How easy is it? Calling on the name of a Savior. Save me. Save me, Lord, from my complacency. Save me from my heart that is okay living this life without you. Living this life without being filled by you. Save me from that. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. All who carry on being content with complacent lives will not be. 
Just hear that out. When the people heard this, verse 37, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So the people heard Peter, and they were cut to the heart. Of course they were. Of course they were cut to the heart. What does the book of Hebrews say? The, the word of God is as sharp as a double-edged sword, piercing soul and spirit, bone and marrow. What does it mean by that? What does it mean? It says it right after that. And revealing the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Living a life that is unholy might not be that big of a deal to you, but at some point in your life, I pray that you are confronted with the word of God and the call to be holy and the truth that there is a God who will one day judge the world. Let yourself be cut. Don't push it away. Let yourself be cut because the one who cuts you loves you. The one who cuts you cuts you in order to save you, not to leave you bruised and bandaged and put to shame, but to take you and to make you holy. It's a life that is better than the life that you've planned for yourself. It's a life everlasting. It's a life of, of joy and peace and hope and happiness. And what do the scriptures say? Pleasures forevermore. Um, don't continue in a life of complacency being okay with not being filled with the Holy Spirit of God. For, what do we read it right here? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children. The promise that he just spoke about. You're young and you're old. Your you're daughters and your sons, they will prophesy. They will, they will dream dreams. They will see visions. They will be filled. And beloved, it will be an experience. Don't be okay with a Christian life that is anything less than that. So they heard this. They heard this. And what happened next? Very important. What do we read next? There, were, there was a lot of people that believed. They heard that and they believed. What happened next? Verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Let me, um, let me take what I just read here about what they did in response to Peter's message, how they began to live this Christian life. Let me take it and equate it with something that I said earlier. Set it up. Prepare the way. Set it up. Set it up. What, what, what was... All of this just came together for me about an hour ago, <laughs> okay? I read this, and I thought about what Moses was told to do, and I saw it in all in a, in a new way. Um, they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Right there. They devoted themselves. These are the things that they did. The apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and to prayer. What was Moses told to do? If you know these uh, if you know what these things mean, you understand this. Moses was told um, to, to, to take some lamps and some lampstands, and we know from the scriptures, your word is a lamp. Your, your word is a lamp to my feet. The apostles' teaching, 
It's the lamp. The, 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 the breaking of bread and to fellowship. Moses was told to take a table and the things that belong on it. And you keep reading Exodus 40 and it's bread. Moses told, put the bread on the table, get the lamps in the lampstand. What else? He said, grab some incense. We also know from the scriptures, incense is a symbol for the prayers of God's people. What they're doing is they're setting it up. They're setting up, just like Moses was told to set up the tabernacle and then Solomon after him setting up the temple that the Spirit of God may fill, they're simply setting it up. They're doing the things they can do. Uh, You cannot create a move of God, but you can prepare for one. And these are the things that they are doing. And what is God doing? It's interesting. You read, they themselves did this, and then God did this. And you kind of see that repeated in this passage. They themselves devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, breaking of bread and prayer. Breaking of bread meaning eating together and also meaning communion. They devoted themselves to those things, and everyone was filled. That's the thing that you can't do. That's the thing that God is doing. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Um, Keep reading, talks about their generosity, selling things, um, meeting together in the temple courts. Oh, this caught my attention. They broke bread in their homes. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Once more, what did they do? They broke bread, they ate together in their homes. And what did God do? Glad and sincere hearts. That's more of that filling. Set it up. Prepare the way. What are things that we can see about our job, our calling to prepare ourselves to be filled? Well, one of the things that we read here, and it's why we've been focusing on this as a church, is creating for ourselves a church that meets in each other's homes. That's what they did, and the reason why meeting in the church is not enough There is something about welcoming one another into our homes that brings us to the place that God has called us to be. And by that, I mean a family. We are the family of God. This is part of how we set it up. If you haven't signed up to be part of a neighborhood group, think of it this way. I, I've, been, I've been thinking this, okay, ooh, ooh, about a while ago, since I've got here, you've heard me talk about how I pray and for more. I read the Bible and I, I pray for more. I read about God added 3,000 in that day, and I pray, look at this city, how many people in the city, how many people in the West Island, how many people within three blocks from this church know virtually nothing about the Bible and are living lives of Maybe complacency, maybe hopelessness. How many people, and look how many spaces we have. There's like rows that are completely empty, okay? But you know what? What happens if next Sunday there's 300 new people? What happens? Are we prepared for that right now? And the answer is no, we're not. We're not prepared for that. If, if 300 new people came, I'd be like, um, well, you should go to Alpha. I mean, that's actually one way we are prepared. Alpha is something that is fantastic if you're new. But otherwise, I would just be like, and come back next week. And, uh, uh, and you know what? I, I don't even think we're ready for that. But I can tell you this. This vision that we have for neighbor groups and for reasons I won't get into, a number in my head is 15 is that we would have 15 neighborhood groups throughout the West Island and the surrounding areas, you know, off island. All of a sudden, bunch, all of a, sudden a bunch of new people are coming. God is adding to their numbers. That's the way it worded it here. God starts adding to our numbers. We have ways to plug them in to discipleship because discipleship happens in that family environment. We have... The, 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 I'm going to use the word infrastructure, created. We are prepared. We cannot create a move of God. We can prepare for one. And I really believe that neighborhood groups is one of the ways that we are preparing for a move of God in our midst. To be prepared. Set it up, is what God says. Set it up. Prepare the way. And there's one other thing that is very, very, very worth saying. Um, this is in Second Chronicles 5. 
hear this. This is one of the things that, that Solomon told the people to do. And they did it. It says, the trumpeters and musicians joined in unison to give praise and thanks to the Lord, accompanied by trumpets, cymbals, and other instruments. The singers raised their voices in praise to the Lord and saying, he is good, his love endures forever. Then the temple of the Lord was filled with the cloud. There was one other thing that they did to prepare. They lifted up their voices. Can you do that? Can you lift up your voices? Is that within our power? It's within our power. This is something Solomon told the people to do in preparation for the filling. And they did it. Lift up your voices. The singers raised their voices in praise to the Lord and saying he is good. His love endures forever. Then the temple of the Lord was filled with the cloud. So we're going to devote ourselves in setting it up, in preparing for more filling. We're going to devote ourselves to meeting in homes. You're going to hear more about that. You've been hearing about it. Sign up on our webpage if you haven't yet. We're going to keep devoting ourselves to teaching the Word of God. Um, breaking of bread, we're going to do that in a moment here. But the breaking of bread, I think the bigger, honestly, the bigger breaking of bread is what we do in the homes when we share meals together. Um, as important as communion is. And to prayer and to worship. That says here they, they, they praised God. Praising God. One of the things we're going to devote ourselves to. Those are the things that we can do. And God is going to do his part. And I want you to hear this. Because the promise is for us and our children. And when you go, when you sign up for neighborhood groups, and when you come to church, I want you wanting something. I don't want you just doing it because I told you to. I don't want you just doing it because it's, it's part of religi religious routine. We want something. We want the promise. We want the promise to be filled, and we are not going to be a people who is complacent, okay with a Christian life that is something less than being fulfilled, something less than being filled with the promise of what he himself promised. Father God, fill us. Fill us and lead us, give us the wisdom to know what you are asking us to prepare for a greater filling, Lord. Uh, we ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen.